Welcome to Sick Flicks, where we take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to examine the greatest gross-out flicks of all time. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're looking at J.P. Simone's unforgettable slasher flick, Pieces. With a title like Pieces and a tagline stating, it's exactly what you think it is, how could this film not catch your eye in a video store? Unfortunately, it also caught the eyes of British authorities, becoming one of the UK's infamous video nasties. Banning the film only helped it grow, though, as more and more gorehounds wanted to find out what all the fuss was about. So, does Pieces really deliver the gory goods? We'll find out when we get to the gore card later on in this video. But for now, let's dive into the plot breakdown. The film opens with a title card telling us it's 1942, and then cuts to a young boy putting together a puzzle. Man, it's nice to see a horror movie open with such a wholesome scene. Wait a minute, that puzzle is a naked woman. Okay, forget the wholesome vibe. We've got a kid putting together a porno puzzle and Mom smacking the shit out of him. In a fit of rage, Mom then smashes a mirror. Um, that's seven years bad luck. I love that they felt we needed to see her smash the mirror half-heartedly a second time in slower motion. Mom sends Timmy off to get a garbage bag while she trashes the room looking for his hidden porn stash. Something tells me Timmy wasn't looking for a garbage bag. The good news is this axe to the head means she only has to endure about seven more seconds of bad luck. The bad news is it's because she's dead. A saw too? Man, little Ted Bundy here ain't screwing around. After dismembering Mama, he finishes the puzzle. Nice work, Timmy. Then the cops bust in and find the crime scene. Mom really lost her head over Timmy's porn obsession. If you thought Timmy was going to get sent off to juvie, guess again. The little scamp fools everyone. This feels like some shoddy police work. Man, we got an axe murder before the credits? Pieces clearly knows my time is valuable and doesn't want to waste any of it. Screenplay by Dick Randall and John Shadow? I don't know why no one ever told me this was written by a porn star and a superhero. With the credits over, we jump ahead 40 years. Thanks, title card. Some person in black is going through a box in a drawer. Damn it, I know the Phillips head screwdriver is in here somewhere. Oh, see, it's right here under the bloody dress of my murdered mother. I knew it was in here. Everything winds up in the junk drawer. I have no idea what this X'd out mother photo has to do with this woman skateboarding, but I'm sure that the movie will explain it all eventually, right? Skateboarding girl looks to be on a collision course with a mirror. When did this movie become a Laurel and Hardy sketch? So that was random, which is a recurring theme in pieces. This movie is only 85 minutes long, and as you're about to discover, it's padded shamelessly to get to that length. For some reason, this woman running into the mirror gives us another flashback to the mother destroying Timmy's mirror. Why? This woman wasn't there. I basically feel like we're watching two different movies at this point. Come on, J.P. Simone, let's reel this thing back in. Uh-oh, someone's putting that puzzle together again. Meanwhile, in a nearby park, Leatherface starts spring training. Hey, you're gonna be long? If so, I'll move somewhere else. Just a few minutes, miss. Don't mind me, this'll just take a minute. Dude just totally chopped this young lady's head off with a chainsaw in broad daylight. Now we jump to Christopher George, who's Lieutenant Bracken. Man, what a great name. And he's investigating the murder. 1982 sure was a simpler time. Kids didn't need iPhones and video games to be happy. They just needed weed and sex on a waterbed. The most beautiful thing in the world is smoking pot and fucking on a waterbed at the same time. <laughs> Ah, the good old days. After that, Professor John Waters shows up. He isn't interested in your boobs, young lady. Didn't you see that episode of The Simpsons? He clearly enjoys the company of men. Bracken and Detective Mike Pence then set off to meet with the Dean. Then Professor John Waters shows up and the Dean says this about him. Yes, uh, he's unmarried and lives with his mother. Unmarried and lives with his mother. Or 1982 code for he's gay. Bracken and Detective Race Bannon then question John Waters, who is supposed to look suspicious because he's got human skulls on his desk. No sale movie, I'm not buying it. Outside, we meet Willard. This guy really loves his chainsaw. Also, he was Bluto in Robert Altman's version of Popeye. Willard here is clearly a red herring too. I've seen enough of these movies to know that the guy who leers his way through the movie is never the killer. Plus, he's only got eyes for olive oil. Next, we jump to the library, where these two want to study. Anatomy. I want to do it underwater. See you in the pool. Man, that's a kinky note for study hall. Back in my day, kids just sent notes that said, Do you like me? Circle yes or no. Also, this was basically Tinder version 1.0. Ian Sarah, whose character name is Kendall, trashes the note. 
Nice shot there, Michael Jordan. If Sarah looks familiar, you probably remember him from his greatest cinematic achievement. It stinks. After that, this gaggle of hens talks trash about Professor John Waters right in front of him. The campus class? <laughs> wow, no one was politically correct on campus back in the Reagan years, that's for sure. Susan heads off to the pool, which is conveniently totally dark. The dean is clearly trying to save on electricity. What the hell is up with the music in this movie? Did they just score it using random tracks from the free YouTube music library? Susan's not alone for a swim, and I don't think the guy in the shadows is Michael Jordan. I do have to admit, I'm kinda surprised she's not doing the breaststroke. The killer gets her with the bug net, which somehow incapacitates her, and then grabs his trusty chainsaw. Why do we need a bug net for an indoor pool exactly? Back at the library, this incel gets shut down. By the way, are you free tonight, huh? Hey, so I'm slayed by a withering look. Gives a shit. Don't feel bad, he's used to it. He wasn't there just to make women uncomfortable with his ham-handed advances, though. He's got a letter for Kendall. Too bad the movie doesn't care to clue us in on what that's about. We're off to watch the killer store his body parts in a freezer instead. Meanwhile, Willard's lurking around with his shears. Don't mind me, I'm not acting suspicious. And then finds this bloody chainsaw and the pieces of Susan. As he tries to flee the crime scene, he takes on Kendall and multiple cops in a handicap match. Detective Leslie Nielsen earns the cops a disqualification for bringing a foreign object into the ring. I'm not sure they really needed to bring a stretcher for Susan. Probably just could have stuffed her in a to-go bag and called it a day. Also, why are they taking crime scene photos after she's been all bagged up? Seems a little late for that. Bracken then decides to interrogate Professor John Waters. Ah yes, Professor. Do you think this crime could have been committed with a chainsaw? Please ignore the bloody chainsaw right next to the corpse pieces when formulating your answer. Look, I'm just an anatomy instructor, not a forensic pathologist. I mean, I'm not even tenured. Even a layman could see it was done with this. Oh, now he's Sherlock Holmes just because he spent a semester as an adjunct down at the community college. Bracken and Detective Mike Pence then go back to the dean to let him know they want to bring some female decoys on campus. Get out of my office. Well, this movie is moving along way too quickly. Gotta slow things down with this completely random dance class. I'm gonna be honest, this feels like an audition for Flashdance. Of course our killer is creeping on the class. He's out of breath because he just came straight here from Jazzercise down the hall. I also want to point out that I really dig this low-rent ripoff version of Funky Town. Makes me want to bust a move. Is this scene still going? Pieces isn't even 90 minutes long and we spent like three of them watching random people dancing. Class finally breaks when one of the ladies has to use the can. Hey Carl, I have to go to John. <laughs> yeah, sure, go ahead. Thanks. Has any woman in the history of womankind ever called a bathroom the John? I mean, outside of this movie? Clearly our killer has to go to the John too. She dances her way downstairs and right into a jump scare. You just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Sorry. Aw, oh, and you almost made it to the John. Bracken takes Kendall to see a psychologist. Seems legit. If you think this means we're going the police procedural route, guess again. We'll never see this guy after this scene ends. If the lieutenant will kindly leave us alone. Okay, Doc, I can take a hint. And here's Linda Day, one of our decoys. Fun fact, she was actually married to Christopher George, a.k.a. Lieutenant Bracken. I try to catch all your games. What's a tennis champion doing in this place? This place is my living. Um, why is a tennis champion also working as a cop? And can we immediately get a show where John McEnroe solves murders between Grand Slam events? We can call it Game, Set, Murder. CBS will love it. Excuse me? Fuck, you can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! Oh, I am, Johnny Mac. There's a lady I was telling you about. Mary's gonna work undercover at the university. And we're totally gonna blow your cover before you even get out of the office. Bracken's partner may look like Leslie Nielsen, but clearly the lieutenant is the Frank Drebin of this police squad. Look, this is the worst tennis ever. No wonder Linda Day has to work a day job as a cop. She couldn't win the C Division tourney at the local rec center. Is this still going on? Well, we got to watch 30 minutes of dancing for no reason earlier. I guess we can squeeze in a five set tennis match too. There's plenty of time to kill, clearly. Do any of your staff know about me or what I'm supposed to be doing here? Not unless your lieutenant has told them. Yeah, he is a bit of a blabbermouth. 
Meanwhile, the killer's back to his puzzle. And we're back to the aerobics dance studio. Hopefully the killer gets his girl this time. He stalks her through the hallways, but she makes it to the elevator. Is that a chainsaw in your overcoat, or are you just happy to see me? How did she not notice this? It's like all those immortals walking around with claymore swords and their windbreakers in Highlander. Inside the elevator, it's Armageddon. Kendall and the cops hear the screams, but when the elevator arrives, the killer is gone. John Waters then appears out of nowhere and immediately looks suspicious. Look, movie, we know neither him nor Willard is the killer. You're not fooling anyone. I like that there's a chainsaw murderer slaughtering people on campus, but Bracken can't get more cops, so he just turns to this random student, Kendall. Later that night, Linda Day is wandering around in the dark. She runs into a totally random kung fu dude. I'm not making this up. Watch this if you don't believe me. Okay, it's stupid and offensive. I am out jogging, and next thing I know I am on ground. <laughs> Something I eat. <laughs> Bad chop suey. So long. <laughs> Take it easy. Dick Randall had ties to the Bruce Lee exploitation subgenre. Trust me, that's a whole other video. And he worked this guy in as a half-assed plug for those movies. And as we can see here, it totally worked. Nailed it. Don't look now, but a reporter is skulking around and the killer is lurking too. Wait, now he has a knife? Why isn't he using the chainsaw? Whatever the case may be, he's really burying the lead. So much for that new waterbed, now where will the kids smoke weed and have sex? After this, we cut back to Kendall, who makes his play for Linda Day. Clearly the dude likes the cougars. He gets shut down, but he's rewarded for his efforts with a jump scare. And now we get some more tennis action. I've never seen an 85 minute movie waste so much time. Pieces could have been over in an hour. And yet, all this nonsense is somehow charming. She's obviously not a fan of marching bands. And she needs to work on her serve. Chris Everett heads off for the locker room for some gratuitous showering while the marching band music keeps playing. This is probably why I can't hear Stars and Stripes Forever without wanting to wash my hair. If you guessed our tennis star isn't alone, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. The girl gets cornered in a bathroom stall and actually wets herself. So bizarre that they felt the need to show this. Then she gets cut in half. We're back to the chainsaw. Fun fact, that's a pig carcass they cut in half for this effect. Where are the controls? That music's driving me crazy. You're not the only one. While we were out here fumbling with that music, the lousy bastard was in there killing her! Bastard! Bastard! Linda Day acting. Jesus, she's really committed. Maybe I can get you some help. Remember that kid, Kendall? I'll see if I can get him, get him down there to you. God, now we're sending Kendall down to work the files. Does this kid ever go to class? Look, he's got a great name, but Lieutenant Bracken may be the worst detective ever. Back in the freezer, the killer's playing corpse dress-up. Don't look now, but I think Quentin Tarantino may be our murderer. John Waters and Linda Day have a terse exchange, and then it's time for a jump scare. After that, Linda Day then goes to question the Dean. She's here to ask about John Waters. Uh-oh, the Dean slipping Linda Day a roofie. Clearly this was a big problem even back in the 80s on college campuses. Back with the cops, Kendall finds a big clue. Mike Pence verifies it. I appreciate it. I'll send you a case of lollipops. I'll send you a case of lollipops? Is this a Kojak reference? The Dean's the one. Apparently his mother was chopped up when he was a kid. Oh my god, it's the Dean who's the killer. He was the kid in the beginning. This is not even remotely surprising. When a film goes out of its way to throw leering obvious red herrings like Willard and Professor Brown at you, it's always going to try to pull the swerve and make the killer the guy you'd least expect. Except that just makes you suspect him more. Dean Tarantino clearly has a foot fetish. Kendall, Bracken, and Mike Pence arrive, but the killer's missing. The cops leave Kendall with Day, who's the worst charades player ever. Things look bleak for Kendall, but Bracken saves the day with a well-placed headshot. Someone's been spending some time down at the range. After that, everything looks great, except there's time for one last jump scare. Oh, and one more. Damn, what a nonsensical ending. I get that horror movies want to give you a good jump scare at the end, but this makes zero sense. How is that thing alive? 
Is the Dean also Dr. Frankenstein? These are just a few of the many questions from pieces that keep me awake at night. And now that we've got that out of the way, let's get to the gore card. By 1982 standards, Pieces is a pretty gruesome slasher flick. We've got an axe murder before the opening credits, a chainsaw decapitation less than 10 minutes in, the cool knife through the head, lots of body parts and blood, and the girl chainsawed in half. FX artist Basilio Cortijo really delivers here. And because of that, I'm giving Pieces three barf bags out of five. Pieces is a film that lives up to its title, that's for sure. It's not perfect, but it damn sure is fun. And really, what more do you want from a slasher movie beyond some blood, some boobs, and some gore? Pieces gives you all three. Have you seen Pieces? Let me know what you think of it in the comments section below. And while you're down there, why not like this video and subscribe to the channel? I'm working a murder case down at the community college and I need volunteers to go undercover and help me catch the killer. Oh, and be sure to check out some of my other videos. You can find links to some really great slasher flicks here on the screen. I'll see you over there, don't leave me hanging. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.